these people have been thrown away by the uh, by the government and the military and 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 in in a lot of ways by uh, society because these people return and communities don't um, they don't really have a place for them so much they have to start over right because these things don't transfer the uh, him being a helicopter pilot now that he has his TBI he can't be a helicopter pilot you know in the states or or anything uh, related to tourism or commercial or whatever so he's just kind of thrown away and in so many ways broken and in so many ways embarrassed by it there's no one in script thinking back on it that we are called loonies by anybody else outside of the group of loonies you know um, there's a moment where we are referred to as loonies by McKenna in this thing and uh, but it's only after we've we've called ourselves that and so I think that so often as you do you take you do you make fun of something in order to kind of make fun of something about yourself in order to kind of not you know feel so ashamed or embarrassed of it you kind of say hey guys I know this too about myself so I don't I, I think that that's really more what Shane is getting to that we do that for that specific reason in order to kind of take the edge off the sting off of the embarrassment for the way that we think other people see us when everyone's having fun on set making this film it looks like they're having fun making this film right and, and you kind of want to be part of the group and the idea that we'd had when we were thinking about doing or the idea that I'd had when we were uh, thinking about doing the introductions and stuff like that things that kept coming up were films like Deer Hunter where you just wish that you were part of this group of people you know however broken however strange you know do you wish that you were kind of part of this group of loonies this like you know band of of misfits in a way and it, it helps that we all get along really well and then we all hang out and and all of that and, and I think at first we were doing it so that we can build a sense of of uh, relationship and community and all that but then you know it, it it's getting to the point where after this I'll probably go hang out with with Trey and and with Boyd and, and all of that in the sense of following McKenna, I think that it, it comes naturally. There's a sense of brotherhood, always, you know. Um, anybody that's, that has served, they're, they're a brother in one way or the other. And here's someone that, that needs you, you know. We were shooting at a school when I first saw the Predator. And I didn't know that we, I didn't, I had no idea that we were going to see him. And we were we were we were kind of ushered into the, like the, the the gymnasium of the school, and there was so many people surrounding this thing that we you couldn't really see it. And then they parted as we all walked in, and we all I, I uh, we all yelled, or maybe I just yelled, and that's the only scream that I can hear. But but there was there was a lot of screaming and. Um, it was, it was crazy. The thing was bigger than I thought it was going to be. It was more alive than I thought it was going to be. The mouth moved and the eyebrows moved and it, it was so surreal. I think what makes it iconic is that it's, it's of a human figure you know, spatially. Um, it's reptile, it it's, it's mimics us, it's, it's more powerful, it's more methodic, it's more like a stealth, um, stealth warrior. Uh, and I think it's, it's just, it's overpowering. It's, it's like an animal, it's, it's more predatorial uh, in the sense of, of just like a cat hunting. McKenna's journey, he comes from simply not being a father, not being responsible, being estranged from his wife, to becoming a leader and becoming a father again, and having a sense of purpose. 
there's a code, there's a, a philosophy to being a soldier. And I think in turn that also makes them get on board when they actually know the reality of the situation between, uh, well, of what's about to happen to Rory. So they, there's a distinctive um, emotional charge that I think they all share. Shane usually makes stories about characters who have depth and who are all struggling with something in their own sort of, <clears throat> their own internal way. Um, and I think a lot of McKenna's unhappiness comes from being estranged from his son. Um, and just the primitive sensibility of it all, that you mess with my kid, that's something you don't do. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. We're bringing in, you know, current issues to this film that their planet is cooling. They need our planet because there's uh, such, they run at such a high rate. Um, and so now they're, and they're also evolving. It's, uh, I think right out of the gate, this story uh, is going to catch people by surprise. The torso was as big as my body. From, from the torso to the head was as big as I was. Yeah, it's, and it's amazing pieces of artwork. Just these sculptures and these robotics, and it's incredible. You're going to be blown away. You're just going to be spiked over the head with surprise. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just everything's new. Everything's fresh. Um, you know, hats off to Arnold and all that um, and the other characters, but we're not... We're not playing then. We're playing our own thing. We're doing our own story, um, and it's 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 exciting for me. The predators have been coming, these aliens, to Earth and hunting us here and there for a while, but now people have noticed. It's now not a secret so much because the government knows what's coming now. They're familiar with predators. They've even established a defense agency dedicated solely to protecting us for, from and preparing us for a predator incursion, an incident. And this movie is about that incident. They got fractured somehow, something broke. And for whatever reason, they found each other. And I think it's interesting that these sort of uh, oddballs with unbelievable combat skills, but somehow um, some kind of, kind of attitude problem, a sort of dirty dozen, have come together in this way. She's not daunted by much. And the fact is, she'll walk through fire if something interests her on the other side of it. So when she sees something that she hasn't studied yet or that gets her brain going, that's what intrigues and causes her to extend to physical heights and, you know, just big leaps of courage that most people, let alone, you know, uh, a scientist could never make. To me, it's special because there's a mask that's frickin' cool, and then you take off the mask and it's even cooler. It's a creature that we recognize, that walks like us, that understands us, that has the same kinds of primitive impulses as a human being, but it's clearly not from here. Let's all make them somehow tie together, not stretch it so that they don't lose the spark of what was so great about the original Predator, which was that human quality, which was that as deadly as it was, it wasn't just a wild animal. It had an intelligence and a cunning and it could look at you and see what you were afraid of and see how to stop and catch you. We're trying to encompass in one movie all the kinds of genre things that we loved, um, from Johnny Quest all the way through Alien to, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg, and never forgetting the realism and the fact that we have an R rating, so yes, heads come off, man. This, these, these predators are going to slice and dice. They're expert hunters. They do this... No one knows why, exactly. We take a stab at it in this movie, explaining a little bit more, but the idea is that it's sort of a vacation for them. For some of us, 
we would go fishing or hunting. For them, they traveled to another world and they put their life on the line. It's kind of like a fear factor for them. These soldiers or hunters or wherever they train, they've got blades that attach to their wrists. They've got infrared cannons that are targeted to their head movements and eye movements that fire plasma blasts. You know, it can take out the side of a, of a mountain. And yet, they always seem to want to play fair somehow. They always want to find an opponent worthy of their skill. The cast is fantastic, from Boyd to Olivia to Keegan and Trevante and Thomas Jane. Like, it's just a really wonderful group, an ensemble of actors to be playing with, you know? Uh, it, and then for me personally, it's a character very different than, than anything that folks have had a chance to see me do up to this point in my career. A lot of people will see the film and they say that he's the bad guy. I never see him quite that way. He just has his own specific wants, right? That aren't necessarily uh, coherent with, every, with what everybody else wants, you know? Um, and I like the idea of playing someone who's not bad and twirling his mustache, but he's just simply pursuing his own agenda that happens to be at odds with everyone else's. This kid is the key. Like, there's, there's, this vessel that has landed on our planet and we can't find it, he knows where it is. He also knows how to open it, right? He may even know what's inside of it because he has a way of just seeing things and figuring things out that have escaped us to this point in time. So he's just the key. They're giant human beings that put on suits that make them even larger, right? It's like, it's so crazy to see them breathe and the way the suit moves with them. Like, the, whoever designs these things, they're incredible. They're, they're feats, like, really, because it doesn't look fake. It looks like alien skin <laughs> with, like, alien breath underneath it coming back and forth. And then, like, once you see them do their, their action, once the stunts begin, and they're like these gigantic parkour athletes that are capable of amazing things, it's, it's kind of surreal. I didn't know people that big could move like that. You think you've seen the worst and that you can prepare for that, but then you recognize that there's another level of menace, of terror, of intelligence that the predator form can take, and so you gotta say, now what? How do I deal with this? How do I deal with something that's not only way more badass than me, but it's possibly smarter? Like up until this point, you could say the predator and humanity may be of equal intelligence, maybe the predator slightly below. Um, the upgrade probably has it humanity beat. I think he recognizes that the script is a blueprint and we know that we need to hit certain marks in order to inform the audience of certain things and to build the story, to drive the plot. But then he lets and encourages, almost demands that the actors break from the script and do what they feel is authentic in the moment, right? So it's a combination of these two things, this wonderful railroad track that he's already laid out for us, and then the freedom to play the encouragement to play within the frame of those railroad tracks. So what you, you hear more than likely is gonna be about 50% dialogue and then 50% what's coming off the actor's head in that moment. Stargazer is ridiculous. I mean, the production value on this joint is off the chain. From the spaceship to Stargazer, um, it's really, I, I'm used to the world of television and so to come and play uh, on a set of this sort of magnitude has been really amazing. It's amazing, like it takes your breath away. Sometimes I just go into the set and walk around just for the hell of it because when will I get another chance to do something like that?
I'm a big Shane Black fan uh, since I was a kid, and um, you know Shane's in, the, which I'd totally forgotten by the way, you know, because he he dies in the beginning. I I I didn't make the connection that that was Shane that's in the Predator, but uh, he he. Um, asked me if I would play a part, you know? We tried to work together a, a couple of times and it didn't work out. And uh, and with this one he said, hey, I'm doing Predator. It's, we got this ensemble cast of guys and he explained it to me and I just said, Shh, tell me, you know, where to be. Creating these characters was uh, um, uh, really kind of the seat of our pants, you know? Uh, wasn't a hell of a lot written down on the page. Um, you know, because there's, I forget how many, but there's a lot of us, there's six of us, say. And, you know, if you were to write down what everybody says, we'd have a script that's 250 pages long. And so Shane, you know, he's been writing and doing this long, uh, uh, long enough. Shane's been writing and doing this long enough that he, uh, opted to leave out, you know, a, a lot of the dialogue, and then we would sort of come up with it on the day, or Shane would, which happened more often, Shane would kind of tell you what he wanted everybody to say. And I said, I thought that was kind of clever. Here's your, your character. He goes, I got this uh, other guy, Keegan-Michael Key, and I kind of wanted to pair you two up. I figure you guys were in the same unit together. And Shane is thinking that, uh, and maybe Shane and Keegan came up with this. They said, because I showed up late for rehearsals, I was working on another gig. They said, um, okay, so basically you guys are in the same unit and Keegan's character had a friendly fire incident where he, the truck got turned around and he opened fire with a big grenade launcher or something on his own guys and he killed everybody except for one guy and that one guy is you, me. I thought, oh, that's fantastic, you know. So. These guys hate each other, but they had to spend three years together in the courts, in the military courts, signing affidavits, you know, uh, giving testimony, saying this happened on this date and this hour, and then where were, you know, what did what'd you do when you woke up that morning? Getting the whole story down for everybody and all the MPs and the courts and the paperwork and we sitting in some little MP courthouse, you know, for hours, you know, one bench and one another and finally one day one of them goes, hey, you want to get a cup of coffee? And that sort of started this relationship that they have. I think what was cool, what Shane told me was, he goes, I don't want a bunch of guys, you know, who have been cast off and they're kind of bumbling. They're like that in real life. They're antisocial. They can't hold a conversation. You know, nettles can't talk to a woman. Um, we've all got serious problems. But when it comes time to um, engage with an enemy, all that goes away and they're like a well oiled machine. And I thought, yeah, that's great. You know, that's terrific. Because that training doesn't go away, it's ingrained into your muscle memory, it's ingrained into your soul. What would happen if these guys then were to be thrust into an extraordinary circumstances where you had this alien hunter come down from another planet and he's after his own objective and the two kind of intersect, you know, we've got McKenna who, who uh, has seen the alien and the government wants to cover that up, so what's the best way to cover that up is, well, you're crazy, you know, so they throw McKenna in with the with the loonies. Their costume is a work of genius, or several geniuses. I mean, it takes a lot of people to put together that costume. And they're all brilliant. And they all have to be brilliant for the whole thing to come together and work the way it does. You know, we've got gears, and we've got remote control guys working on this, and we've got all the sculptors and all the research guys making it look and feel real. Um, the latex guys, the, I mean, it's their, the painters, the, there's so much that goes in to this, to these costumes. The idea of this person who was an actor in the first one, 
coming back to this franchise, writing it, directing it, you know what I mean? Having such having such a big part of this, and obviously it means so much to him. And Shane is the biggest comic book person, I won't say nerd, but person that I know. And just anything involving this realm of life, I, if Shane's involved, I will forever like try to be you know, involved because he's so knowledgeable about all of it. And again, having the ties to it uh, uh, when he was younger is just, yeah, it's amazing. It's a once in a lifetime experience. I had the opportunity to kind of incorporate this idea of loss and losing my my uh, my unit or having in my mind he's uh, he was the the captain of his unit he made a bad call got everyone killed uh, and so he's lived with that and then here comes this guy who is fighting to save his family save his kid and then these this motley crew that I've been kind of in cahoots with for the past however many months and have the opportunity to again form this family and then help this man who is trying to save his kid, you know, save the world, but more importantly, save his kid. To him, more importantly, save his kid. And that's just such a beautiful thing, man. Like, and, and this guy seeing that and seeing the passion behind that, to me, that's, you know, and then you see the kid, and then the kid's such a, a wonderful kid, and he has that longing. He's like, oh, yeah, I, I want that. I want that family thing. I want to I experience that because I didn't have that. And to me, like, pulling on that emotional cord and showing that, facet of this individual who, you know, he was a, a stone cold killer in a sense, you know, he, he was someone who is so hardened, you know, having the opportunity to show the heart of that is always what I look for. We are just a collective of different yet so very alike individuals in the sense that we are all, again, longing for that connection, longing for that brotherhood that we all had at one point in time that we were kind of taken out of. Uh, for whatever reason it may have been. Some of us, you know, like in my case or in Nebraska's case, caused uh, my, my unit to be killed and that. And others may have just killed others, you know, uh, in unsavory ways. Others may have just been discharged because of uh, mental ailments or what, whatever it may have been. But we are all just this collective that met each other in this... Uh, PTSD group two. The relationship that he has with the emissaries it, it, it's unique because Nebraska is someone again like I said he doesn't really have much to live for in a sense at this point and so it's just after you get over the initial shock of there being aliens it's just like well what's up man you know <laughs> you want a cigarette you want to smoke like we're here together you're helping me I guess we're, we're a unit now you know what I mean we're family in a sense uh and so, yeah, it's just a unique situation. It's a unique, I guess, relationship. But whenever you, I mean, just like with anything, you know, you see someone fighting alongside you, they become your brother. And I, I mean, and, you know, as ridiculous as it sounds, I mean, they're fighting to save your life. Yeah, you, you know, I got your back too. Being on films like this, you really appreciate, you get the chance to at least appreciate, you always appreciate, but you get the chance to appreciate more just the brilliant minds that we have that people don't see their you know their faces just brilliant people involved in this process man just brilliant brilliant people and like these things are fabricated from their from their brains you know what i mean like they take bits and pieces from other things obviously but it's just an amalgamation of these ridiculous ideas that's insane to me like what we do is easy compared to just fabricating this idea that's ridiculous so it's just like stepping onto the ship I had to go and shake everybody's hand that was involved in Megan. I'm like, you guys are what? You know, and then seeing the predators, you know, seeing how the mouths move. We have people behind the scenes controlling this with like, you know, video game controllers, you know, it's it's really impressive to see. You really appreciate just the brilliant people you get to be involved with. My part is like pr a cool part because I get to do some pretty cool stuff like I get to drive the alien spaceship, I get to uh, wear the predator mask, I get to uh, have a predator wear scotlet and that was, that's pretty cool so I was like really excited to do it and also there's also like 
predator hybrids in this movie as well. And like there's big upgrade predator, and then there's also these other cool predators. It's like so much you can take and put it in all in one movie. He's a kid with autism and he goes to school, he, he likes chess and he gets bullied, but he's really smart. And he likes to make things and he likes to figure out puzzles and he has his basement that he likes to hang out in a lot. And he, um, one day he gets sucked into this big adventure. I hang out with the ladies a lot on, on set and off set and sort of like best buds. So it's, they're, they're cool, they're cool characters. It was awesome. My favorite, part about, my favorite part about the ship is like the whole control section with like these bars of the controls right there and then there would be like huge controls right there with a giant chair. I, th I, well, I mean, for any chair, any chair is big for me. But for like these huge muscular men, um, like they're small on it too, it's a huge chair. What I like about it is it's so tall and it has big muscles and it has a very scary face and it has it has like all these cool tools like a shoulder laser cannon thing and all the uh, and all these other cool things like it's invisibility cloak so he has some pretty cool things. When I saw the predator for first time, I was like, "Holy cow! He's a he's just like I imagined him to be." He was like tall, big, scary looking. So anyways, I walked up to him and I gave him a fist bump. I am actually a very big fan of the Predator franchise. I am um, I'm one of those people who knows the entire canon. I um, I know um, the Alien versus Predator movies a little more intimately than most people I would say do, um, and, but but there's uh, so I I'm, I'm actually I am a legitimate fan of the of the series. The humor for him is armor, and he thinks that he's. It's funny because I don't think he's really fooling anybody. Everybody in the group, you know, he he belongs to this group of gentlemen that go to group therapy to overcome PTSD, to overcome depression, um, to overcome the, the the trauma that they went through during during war. And his is actually quite a, quite an obvious, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, a, a projection or, or, or a behavior trait that people do is, oh, I'll laugh it off, or I'm going to participate in gallows humor. It's the only way I'm going to make it through my day is by telling dirty jokes. And by the way, sophomoric jokes, very jokes that he, I think he wants to, to fill a room with jocularity so that it lifts up his mood. And it's very transparent. It's very transparent that he's hiding something else. He wants them to come across as, as humans that are broken, not as cartoon characters, not as clowns. And they have their idiosyncrasies, and we're, and, and we're looking for the balance of how much idiosyncratic behavior do we use before it turns into camp, or before it, turns in, before, before it becomes too exaggerated for, for it to be palatable for the moviegoer. Um, and at the same time, we want, to, uh, we want to make sure, Shane wants to make sure that there's a certain degree of humor but he doesn't want them to be uh, two-dimensional characters. He wants them to be able to feel pain and feel fear and feel uncertainty and feel doubt and at the same time be really, really good at the jobs that they used to do. There is a sense of, of numerous locations. There's a sense of, of the film being, for lack of a better word, wide. And that's, that's why I employ the word epic. It has a sense that the movie's important and there's a thing happening on our world and there's a thing happening in another world and they're, they're coinciding and, and they're intersecting and there, there's people with lofty feelings about, about uh, uh, you know, what is manhood and what does it feel like to be, feel needed or wanted. There's, there's these great kind of, overarch of overarching emotional themes that are taking place in the piece as well as as you read the script it feels very freight train it doesn't stop it's a movie like this when I come on set every day when you when you have this experience then you go see a movie you don't dare get up until all the credits are done because you're looking at all of the hard work 
that all of those those hundreds of names that are scrolling up the screen did. It, 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 this swamp and the star, and the interior, talk about a labyrinth. There's Stargazer itself. It's its own place. You could live there. You could live on the stage. It, it's really, it's really impressive. It was so impressive. I would never, I'm not a soldier, so I would not think to attack something like that. I wouldn't ever think I'm gonna move forward and attack a creature that looks like that. It's so impressive, it's so large and fearsome. I, I've, I've, it was, I was really impressed and got a little, like the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Shane's relentless pursuit of, of finding the, the most truthful thing we can do in a moment and what that opens up. He's also very facile because he still allows you to go, all right, I'll let you do that bit. I'll give you a bit, but how about we try to find a way? Let's put some effort into anchoring it into the truth so we're not stopping the movie for a joke and then continuing. What, and, and I think that's part of what makes him special. It's gonna be a very, very exciting roller coaster ride because there's a lot of new elements being thrown at you along the way, and they're giving the audience enough credit. It was working with Shane that made it really appealing to me, and I sat down with Shane, and, um, and I just think that he's one of the best directors and writers. I mean, I have loved his movies for so long, and I think that he does something that's really interesting and really creative and um, very new. And it's always, he's always trying to, to, to surprise the audience, even if it's just with a line or something that just feels very real that, we're, that we wouldn't normally see on camera. Dr. Casey Brackett is the top in her field. She is an evolutionary biologist. She is um, essentially a scientist who who researches how creatures change and adapt. And she has been in the CIA and the government's basically list of top people to go to if there was ever contact with intelligent life forms. And so this is something she's been waiting for her entire life. Not knowing if it's ever going to happen, but she goes through the whole process and they bring her in and they go through the whole thing and it's been years and she's you know living her life and all of a sudden the call comes through and they need to bring her in because the predator is changing and adapting in a way that they don't know what it means and, um, and they need her expertise. It's definitely terrifying, it's definitely um, surreal, um, but at the same time it's, it's, it ignites something inside of her, it's, it's, it's completing something inside of her that you know, this is the epitome of what she studies. This is something completely different than everything here on Earth. And that is very exciting for her, but she's running for her life. You know, at one point she's chasing to capture this predator and wanting to study it, wanting to see it, wanting to just, even if, not even, if, even if no one ever sees her research, it's just for her, she wants to be up close communicate, talk with it, touch it, see it. Um, but, you know, at the same time, her life is in danger and she's got to run for her life. The first time that I actually got to see the entire predator fully put together uh, with the mouth and then everything's moving was um, on set. We were filming something and then they brought the cast into this other room just to see. And it was wild. I had no idea. I, how alive and real it would be. It's identifiable in a human way as well. I mean, it's, it's got arms and legs, it's got a head, so there's something very familiar about it, um, but at the same time, it's like nothing we've ever seen before. Uh, it's, you know, you think that you, you know an opponent. Um, you go up against another human, you know what their capabilities are, and you look at this predator and it's got arms and legs and the head and it, it, it seems like it would be human-like, but of course it's not and its strengths and abilities are so uh, far beyond anything that we could even 
think about. And I think that's what makes it so terrifying is that um, it's, it's so familiar, yet um, you, we have no idea how to deal with it and how, how to survive it. Being on this set um, is, it's so, it's, it, unless you're here, you know, you really, it's, it's hard to, to grasp how, the scale of, of these things and how real everything is. You go into this, the, the spaceship is real and the ark is real and, you know, we actually built an entire forest. I mean, you walk in and it's, and it's not just a small little patch. I mean, we built a forest, we built a swamp and you're here and it's, they're real trees. It's, it's the real, it's like a, they, they built a cliff and it's inside and we're here doing it. And, um, it, you know, you're sitting in the, in the predator spaceship captain's chair and it's massive. And, um, and those things really help to ground you to the reality of the story you're telling.